of celebration this morning is hymn number 363. Please stand as you are able and join us in singing.
let us unite in the historic confession of our Christian church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Miss Betty Spence. Betty is uh, with us this morning, longtime member of St. Paul, uh, has already shared once in the contemporary service and uh, now will share a, a brief testimony uh, here with us this morning. We're glad that you're with us. Thank you. Not too long <clears throat> after Sam and I moved to Columbus, I was in the grocery store discussing the price of bacon with a stranger. After we talked a while, she invited me to her church, St. Paul United Methodist. We had not been to church anywhere, so I went the next Sunday. She met me at the door and introduced me to the minister. He was very nice and asked me if he could visit me the next day. During the visit, he suggested that I visit other Methodist churches in the city, which I did not do. <laughs> I have been a member of St. Paul since 1967. The lady who invited me was Jean Norris, and the minister was Guy Hutcherson. Sometime after that, I was at the laundromat and talked to a very friendly lady who was a member of St. Paul United Methodist Church. When I told her I had attended there, she invited me to come to her Sunday school class. We later joined what is now the Miller Wilson Sunday School class, and I am still there thanks to Doris Locklear. In 2001, <clears throat> my sister Glory and I were both widows, and because our brother-in-law had Parkinson's disease, we started talking about maybe living together so we could help Sarah care for him. Both of my sisters lived in Savannah. When I told people we were thinking about it, they thought for sure I'd go to Savannah. They said, oh, how wonderful it would be to live in Savannah. And it would have been, but I just could not leave St. Paul. I could have left my house, but I could not leave this church. Sarah's husband died early that summer, <clears throat> and this church supported us during that time. Sarah and I has Alzheimer's and lives in a wonderful home where we know she gets excellent care. The members of this church have continued to support us during the sad times and the glad times. I have many friends here, and this church really is the center of my life. And that's also the center of Gloria's. She taught Sunday school today. <clears throat> I don't have to invite you to attend St. Paul because you're already here. But if you have friends that need a church home, I highly recommend that you invite them to St. Paul United Methodist Church. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Let us prepare our hearts for prayer.
Gracious Heavenly Father, we, we take a moment, O oh God, to set aside the week behind us, the day before us, and the week before us. We carve into this moment a time, O oh God, where we are repositioned and we posture ourselves in such a way that our focus becomes you. We have many valuable things, O oh God, in our lives. Some of those things, O oh God, are very tangible. Some of those things, O oh God, are figurative. Some of those things, O oh God, involve people, loved ones, very valuable things to our hearts. Lord, give us a moment over the next hour, the next days, to dive into the perspective that you have of us when you consider us valuable, worth dying for, worth giving of so much, whether it's redemption, forgiveness, whether it's kindness, whether it's plan, hope, future, strength, all things, God, you give us with no strings attached. And you give us, O oh God, despite our faithlessness. So God, may we contemplate and consider, not out of guilt, but out of a conviction of what is right, to respond, O oh God, in prayer, in service, in gifts, in witness, in presence. May you, God, be glorified as we carry your kingdom with us in our places of work, in our homes, and where we play. May you, O oh God, above all, be glorified. And we'll be careful to give you all honor and glory as we remember the prayer that you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Our hymn of preparation is hymn number 378. Please stand as you are able and join us in singing verses 1, 2, 5, and 6.
us now worship God with his tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Receive these, O oh God, your tithes and our offerings. May they be used, O oh God, to further your kingdom and hasten your return. In your name we pray. Amen.
Please remain standing as we read our passage for today. It comes from the 40th Psalm, verses 6, 7, and 8. Hear the word of God. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. Burn offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, here I am. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. The peace of Christ be with you. We welcome you to our worship services today. We're so very glad that you are here. Whether you are a member or a visitor, you're in the right place. And uh, as the uh, children come forward, I invite you to greet one another and register your attendance with the red pew pad. everybody doing? All right, pretty good. All right. Uh, you, ever have, you ever have a can? What can we do with this can? Oh, well, we can recycle it. Are you all right? We can use it again. That's right. What else can we do with it? You ever play with it? Mate, what's that? We can crush it. What else can we do? How about kick it? You ever kick it? You know, there's actually... Baseball. Well, we could throw it like a baseball. You know, there's a game that's called Kick the Can. Have you ever played that one? You like to play that? I would like to play that. It's kind of like hind go seek. I like to play kick you, the you like to play kick, kick the can and kick the milk jug, huh? Um, I saw, I saw the dogs kicking the can. With you, the you did? Well, you know, the way you play kick the can is really interesting. There's a guy, it's kind of like hind go seek. And whoever has, this is like the base, and you put it down, and then someone closes their eyes, and then they count, and everybody else goes and hide. And, and then when they get through counting, they try to find everybody. And if they see you, you've got to, the person who's it, if they see you, you've got to run back as fast as you can, and you've got to kick this. And if you kick it, then you're safe. It's like you're on the base. If you get tagged, you're out. Yeah, that's right. If you get tagged, you're out. If they tag you before you can kick the can, you're out. But the object is that someone is it, and they go and they search for you, and you try to hide from them. You know, there's a place in the Bible, they weren't playing kick the can, but it's kind of like this. The psalmist in Psalm 139 is talking about how God searches, uh, searches after the person, sort of like kick the can. Listen to this. You want me to read it? Okay. Oh, Lord, you want to read it? Okay, let me read first, all right? Okay, yeah, then we'll read the note, okay? All right, ready? It says, Oh, Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts. You search out my path and my lying down. And you're acquainted with all my ways. And then it goes on to say, Where can I go from you? Uh, if I send to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed and chill, you are there. If I take on wings to the morning and settle at the, the farthest limits of the sea, even your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, Surely the darkness cover me, the light around me becomes night. Even the darkness is not too dark for you. And the night is as bright as day, for the darkness is as light as you. What the psalmist is writing about is that God seeks after him, uh, and he always looks to find him. Yeah, you see? I see him too. I see him every Thursday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, next time you see a can, now you can recycle it. That's the best thing to do is recycle. And, but you could also play kick the can. And when you play kick the can and when someone's searching after you, I also want you to know that God searches after you too, okay? Yeah, that's exciting, isn't it, right? Yeah, right. Let's, okay. Let's pray, okay? <laughs> All right. Shh. Let's, let's pray. Are y'all ready? Oh God, we give thanks for your love and your mercy. We give thanks that you seek after us and that you always love us and you care for us. I pray, God, that for all these that sit with me, that they'll know that you will go to the, the, the farthest links to find us. And for that, we are grateful, oh God. 
I, I pray, Lord, that if there's ever a way that from a, an empty tin can uh, we can think of your love, then, that, that, then so be it, O oh God. Uh, guide these, protect these who, uh, who are with me. Watch over and bless their families. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Bye, guys. Sue's pinching in for Wayne. Wayne and Jenny are uh, were participating in a uh, one of their closest friends uh, a wedding for their child, and uh, they are celebrating and giving thanks. And I appreciate you guys filling in for them. Let, let's pray. Well, God, what we want to do at this moment is what we pray every time that we look at a portion of Scripture. We want it to become. Uh, life giving for us. We want it to become the gospel. Uh, we know that that cannot happen without your spirit and your presence. And so grant to us again uh, your spirit in such a way uh, that uh, what was read for us becomes living words and it finds a resting place uh, into the depths of our souls and we find ourselves being changed from the inside out. Uh, this we pray and we hope and we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. Last week, uh, we started a conversation that we hope will go for the next few weeks about the will of God, uh, that God, that God's will is that God reconciles the world unto himself. It's not something that we can do. Uh, it's something that God offers to us. Uh, there's an invitation for us uh, to, to experience that, to be exposed to God's will, God's will of reconciliation, uh, God's works of redemption. This is what we 
believe and, and what we see in the life and death and resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ. And so God offers what he does to us. He invites us to be a part of his family. We used a text uh, last week from the book of Ephesians uh, where Paul writes about this invitation uh, to be a part of God's family. Uh, and, and what we are faced with is how to respond to that. We, we said that's really going to be the question before the house uh, for the next uh, six weeks. How do we respond to what God has already done? And so each week what we want to do is we want to, to highlight a component of what a response would look like. And today we want to borrow Psalm, the psalmist writings, the psalmist's life, where he, he journ, journ, uh, where he journals about his own experience and what we have in Psalm uh, chapter 40. It's an example of what it's like to respond uh, to God's will, what it's like to respond to God's grace and mercy. Now, to understand a little bit about the text, we need to know what's going on in the life of the psalmist. And he talks about this in the beginning of, of the scripture lesson, in the beginning of Psalm 40. He, he describes his life as dire. Uh, he uses some specific words, desolate pit, pit of tumult, depending on what version of the Bible you have. Some of the derivatives that also show up in this text uh, is words like ruin, words like storm, words like devastation. Uh, regardless of what adjective that is used to describe the psalmist's life, it's definitely not high times. This is not things that he's looking forward to. He finds himself in a pit. He finds himself bogged down. Uh, what do you do when you find yourself in situations like this? However you want to describe it, words like storm, ruin, devastation, pit, clay, bogged down. Uh, what do you do when faced with situations like this? I, I thought about some of the ways that I have responded to situations like this. Uh, act out. That seems to be an easy one. That if I don't like what's going on, then it's easy for me to, to act out in front of other people or, or to blame. Blame other people for the state that I'm in or for just the way that life is setting up. Sulk. Now, I know no one in here sulks. I told everybody that's what the 9 o'clock, John was addressing that, and he preached the 9 o'clock, but not the 8.30 and the 11. So you just kind of check out for about a minute or two because I know no one ever in here pouts, right? Or complains. No complainers here, correct? Things don't work out the way you want it. You find yourself in a, in a place, a, a storm. You find yourself in, in, in a description that you would say, I, I'm ruined in some form or fashion. It's devastating to me. Complain. That seems to be what I would do. The psalmist chooses a different way. The psalmist cries out. To use another word, he prays. I thought about uh, this scripture lesson, um, Psalm 40, this week. Uh, one of the things that John and I had the pleasure of, of attending was our, our prayer guild here at St. Paul has an annual lunch, and it's about this time of the year. It took place this past week. And uh, they, they invite us to lunch, and it's just a wonderful time. While we were eating, I, there was probably, I don't know, 30 people there, maybe, maybe more, maybe a little bit less. The actual prayer ministry, the prayer guild that we have here consists more of 30. Their whole, their whole job here at St. Paul, how they serve this church, part of the way that they serve God is just to pray for people. Pray for me, pray for the staff, pray, pray for you, pray for situations that present themselves. Sometimes people call in, sometimes they might email in, sometimes they know of just the situations uh, of what's going on in, inside of our church, what's going on inside of our city. Uh, and, and one person a day comes up to this place for no telling how long, they just disappear in our prayer room. And all they do is pray. We were eating lunch. I thought about all the hours that were spent on their behalf for us. Not just us here, maybe people who were before us, maybe the people who are even going to be after us. Who, who knows 
what their hours of prayer has done for us. It's hard to even get my mind around that people would spend that many hours a week in prayer for pe some people they don't even know. They just cry out to God. That's what the psalmist is doing. At some point, now we don't know when, at some point, God shows up to the psalmist. And this is very important to the text. And the psalmist is changed by that experience. Now, if we were to use, if we were to take this Old Testament uh, hymn, this Old Testament psalm, and put it in the New Testament, the, maybe the way that we would describe it is that this, this person, this psalmist, is transformed by God's grace. If you ask me why I follow God today, it, it's this right here. The fact that you really can experience God. I don't mean, uh, you know, for most of us, when we start talking, or at least when we hear people to describe their life with God, to describe their relationship with God, we speak of it in cognitive terms. Uh, and, and that's part of it. But when we talk about faith in God, we talk about God's grace, that really is an experiential aspect to it. You really can't experience God. And it changes the psalmist. And it changes me. And it changes you. Not just something that we can fathom, write down, logically maybe understand, but experience God. Now whether you use grace of God, whether you use Holy Spirit, it, it, it's semantics. The idea is that the psalmist finds himself in a place, he cries out to God, God shows up and his life is changed by that experience. And so everything that he does is now seen via that experience. It changes his, how he sees its pa his past, it changes his very present, and then when he looks forward, he now looks forward in confidence with the hope of being with God because he has been changed from the inside out. That's what it shows up in the text. He, he is confident about his future because go, he knows God is with him. And so his life now, post experience, is a continual response to God because he sees a constant God who gives grace, who showers down grace all the time to him. And so he wants to respond back, not just an initial response, but respond back all the time. You see this in verse 2, you see it in verse 3, verse 8, 10, verse 9. He's filled with gratitude. See, his life has changed. And he talks about it. God has set my feet on this place. He, is, he has changed my mouth, my heart, my lips. They're all different now because of this. It's not private for him anymore. And so often when we talk about our faith... And when we think about our faith, we see it in private terms. Now, there are private components to it. He is expressing back in gratitude to God. But it also has a public dimension as well. The children's sermon, we used a tin can. Have you ever opened up a Coke or a soft drink and, and you pour it into your glass or your cup and you're not paying attention and before long the foam, you know, the drink starts rising to the top and, you know, we, we get real quick and we try to slurp it up and then it just kind of falls over onto the counter or onto the floor. Has that ever happened to you? That's right, it, it does. You're not happy. It, okay, it, 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 we all do it from time to time. That's sort of like what the psalmist is experiencing. God has now poured into his life and he can't contain it all. And so this public dimension of his, his now faith via the experience of God just flows out into people. The psalmist even talks about this. He anoints my head with oil. What? My cup overflows and so when he finds himself out he can't help 
but talking to what the text says out into the congregation about this experience. Now there's private components. He expresses to God in gratitude, but there's public components because his, his life now just overflows because of God's goodness. Maybe the better way is to draw an example from literature. A couple of weeks ago, John preached the 8.30 and the 11 o'clock service, and he, 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 the, the, he began the service, uh, the sermon, with uh, quotes from Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. That, one of my favorites. Maybe, maybe the next most uh, famous uh, writing of Dickens would be A Christmas Carol. Do you know that story? Ebenezer Scrooge. I know it's not Christmas time yet, you know, but we're getting close to it. You, you know the story of Ebenezer Scrooge? <laughs> you talking about a crusty, crusty old man in the beginning. That's Ebenezer Scrooge. He is unhappy. He's miserable. He's mean. He's bitter. He's short. I mean, he's just, he, he, is, he is not a nice person. And then he has this experience. We know those, that's his dreams. He's visited by three ghosts, past, present, future, and he wakes up. What happens when he awakes? He's totally different. What? He's changed by the experience. And so everything that he was, he's not anymore. He's loving, he's kind, he's gracious, he's generous. The people he used to beat up on and mistreat, now he provides for, he cares for. And it's not just the, the Cratchit family, it's everybody he runs in, in, in contact with. His life is changed by that experience. So much so that he can't go back and be what he was before and neither can the psalmist. His life is different. He's changed. The psalmist has changed so much that his whole attitude is different from the inside out. He talks about his ears. He now can hear from God. His stomach, his gut, the seed of who he is has changed. He now lives out of love instead of obligation. Did you hear the text? Sacrifice and offerings you do not desire, but you've given me now an open ear. Then I say, here I am. In the scroll of the book, it is written to me, I delight to do your will. It's not something I just have to do. I wonder how many of us this morning, if we were to talk about our relationship with God, if we were to talk about our faith, if we were to talk about our church life, we would speak of it in terms of obligation. I have to do this. It's required of me. I do it, but on the inside, yeah, I'd really rather do something else. It's something I check off on my list. I don't want people around me to, to you know, they might call me, you know, if I don't show up here, somebody might inquire about what I'm doing. Obligation. Is that it? Is that what being a follower of God is really about? Obligation? Not for the psalmist. He's changed. And so instead of it being obligation, it becomes an act of love. That, you can't manufacture that. That, that is the result of God changing us from the inside out to where it just becomes an act of love. I want to, not I need to, or not I have to. I, I wonder how many in a, of us this morning, it's obligation when it comes to our life with God. It doesn't have to be that way. Now don't miss this, because everything sits on this this morning. The entire experience of the psalmist comes because he prays. 
not, not prayer like a laundry list, not prayer because it's something I just have to do or, or I, you know, I know somebody told me I was supposed to do it, but prayer because it's a means of life for the person. It's like oxygen for the soul. Prayer because it's a response to what God has already done and you get exposed to that and you experience that and, and you want to continually respond back. I'm not sure. Well, let me say it to you this way. And however we respond to God's goodness, that's the question before the house. Prayer definitely is a component of it. It becomes a means that uh, God cultivates inside of us so that what, whatever makes us who we are, if you call it your heart, your identity, it doesn't matter. That changes. And so you and me, we, we then walk, respond, we, we, we live this relationship with God to where it flows naturally. Not something that we have to uh, gunny sack into a bag or fabricate or, or, or muster up the strength to do. It just comes naturally because we're changed from the experience of God's grace. Now we're, we're in a season where our entire church, whether it be in our committees or whether it be uh, nominations for leadership for next year, whether it be in finance, looking at how the year is gonna end, what our next year's budget's gonna be, uh, part of what we're doing is we're examining ourselves as individuals and also as a group. We just started this. Over the next five, six weeks, that's what we're talking about. Would you be willing to make prayer one of the central priorities of your life next year? Now, we're not going to try to you know, tell you what that means or, or, or how many minutes are invested in there. That, that's not what we're getting at. Would you just be willing to begin next year? To where prayer, if you don't pray, then you're starting to pray. If you do pray, then, then you're going you're to add something else to that. And then to allow that to be used as a means to an end so that God can continually conform us more into his image. Would you be willing to do that? I do know the psalmist's life has changed because he prays. And I have seen it thousands of times. It does work. It does lead to transformation. And so however we respond to God's grace, some aspect of it does have to be prayer. So may it be for you. Not just now. Not just in the year to come for next year. But as long as you have breath inside of you, may your life be cultivated by prayer. Let us pray. The, the truth is, O oh God, whether we pray for hours or, or whether we don't, the unfortunate fact that if our life is not cultivated around this, We limit our response. As difficult as it is to hear that, oh God. And so do a couple of things for us, oh Lord, we pray. You know our hearts. You know our needs. You know the seasons of life that we, you find us in. In the ways of the adjusting of our priorities whether we're in a, a pit or whether we are not. Make it crystal clear for us 
so that what we see is your grace and mercy. And that saturates our soul. And then begin your works of transformation that we cannot do on our own. And then help us to respond continually out of your love for us. Allow that to be oxygen for us, O oh God, we pray. And we ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Our hymn of consecration, you'll find it's uh, 347, hymn 347, spirit song. It's just two verses. I want to invite you to stand as you're able. I want to give you an opportunity to make any types of confessions of your faith, or if you'd like to unite with the membership of this congregation, hymn number 347, spirit song. Stand as you're able as we sing this hymn together. benediction.